we're out of the way, we're back into this. Uh, and we're still, huh? You're moving. Okay. Anyway, this is the final instructions that Paul's given to the, to the group in Rome, um, the Christians there. And next week we're going to look at something that I find quite interesting, and that's people who assisted Paul, people who put into practice that which he had talked about in this particular book. And uh, just an encouragement that if they can do it, we can do it, that type of thing. <clears throat> As we start, I kind of want to look at just a little bit of uh, by way of introduction, a little bit of what we looked at last week, Romans 15, verses 14 through 16, says this, Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you are you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written to you more boldly, I have written more boldly to you on some points as re, uh, reminding you, because of the grace given to me by God, that I may be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul, in this, was to the point of encouraging them. And I see something really neat in this. The very first thing that he said in that particular passage is this. I myself am confident concerning you. Uh, I have some people in my life that I can say that about when it comes to spiritual things. Other people that I know, I can't say that about. Paul, in a blanket statement, was saying that about the church in Rome. And you got to look back and remember what the church in Rome was facing. They were being persecuted. They were uh, horribly being treated because of their national leadership uh just bad things that were going on we looked at that previously and so i don't want to get clear back into that that's they were it, we'll just leave it with this they were under persecution and yet they remained true to the faith you know what happens if after tuesday we see that in our country You know, I suspect that a lot of people that go to church and put on a, I'm going to use the term Christian face as they go to church, will quit going if that happens. If persecution is about to begin in our country, they're going to back out. And here's the reason why. Because they're, one, just putting on a face and looking like a Christian. Or two, they've not been developed as a Christian. Both of those are going to pose a problem, and so it's imperative that we're well-grounded. Now, one thing that I have tried to stress as we've gone through the book of Romans is the... What's the word? Not chronology, but something to that effect where the book stacks on, you know, one thought on top of the other on top of the other, and that's consistent in Paul's writing, and that's why a lot of chapters start out with, therefore, or uh, because of this, or that kind of thing. It, it's just one thought that progresses to the next, to the next, to the next, and to the next, and finally has a culmination in the end of the book. Uh, Paul had written to these people the basics of Christianity. Uh, 
after all that we've looked at, and, and I, I went back, well, according to this, April 17th, I was in Romans chapter 5 uh, in last year, you know, in our last, last April, I was that clear up to chapter 5 already, so uh, when did we start this? I'd have to go back quite a ways to actually look, but it's been nearly a year of going over this book and so I, I suspect the flow of the book, the the constitution of the book has kind of lost its edge and I would hope that we would take the time to continue to read and study and contemplate some of the things that are written in this particular book. He started out with the absolute basics, all have sinned, and because of that sin, we need a Redeemer. That Redeemer is in Christ. The only one who could save us is Christ. Not the law, not works, not anything we could do, but Christ. And he progressed to the idea of Okay, now you're saved, so what? And he started the idea with how shall we live then? Or, or, uh, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. I've been accused, I don't know how many times, because I say that what we do cannot save us, that it's because I want to sin. And I'm fine with that. Well, no, I'm not. I don't want to sin. I'm honest enough to say that I do. <laughs> a lot of people aren't, and I don't care. I'm going to remain honest enough to say that I'm not perfect. I don't want to sin. It's not okay. It's never, ever okay to sin. But it doesn't destroy our salvation. It, it just doesn't, because we're no, we are no more saved by what we do than we are unsaved by what we do. That is the only aspect in which it matters not. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. Read chapter 6 in its entirety and you'll see that even Paul stood to that. And then in chapter 7 and 8 embellished it a bit to such an extent that in, in chapter 8, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because if I'm in him, I, am, I cannot be condemned again before God. Okay, This is the kind of stuff that he was telling them. All the while, he says, I'm confident concerning you. That's what I want from myself, and that's what I want from you. I mean, I, that's that's my heart's desire. Then he got on to leading other people to Christ. And how do we do that? What difference does it make how we live? You know, in, in chapter 10, he says, it's my heart's desire and my, my constant longing that my own countrymen would come to know Jesus as their Savior. He didn't use those exact words. That's a paraphrase of it, admittedly. But that's what he was saying. And then, above and beyond that, it was his heart's desire that the Gentiles would come to know Christ. And how do we go about doing this? He tells us in chapters 12, 13, 14, and then in 15, it's about how do we maintain ourselves in such a way. That is where we are with this. And it, it's just an interesting progression. But he said it with boldness. What he taught them, he taught them, he said, I've written more boldly to you. I've written more boldly. Why? Because they could take it. <laughs> if they can't take it, it isn't going to change the message God had given Paul to tell the church in Rome. 
And so he laid it on the line. He didn't worry about stepping on toes and making people feel bad and making everything just a, a peachy way of life for everybody because everything's good and there's no good, bad, or indifferent. It's all just whatever is whatever. My truth is my truth, yours is yours. That's not how it works. And so because of that, he wrote boldly to them. Push the right button. He did it ministering to them. Uh, verse 16 says that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. Ministering what? The gospel. The gospel. Everything else pales in comparison to the gospel because that is what matters for eternity. I'm going to spend the whole time on introduction. I don't want to do that, so I'm going to try to move. Uh, he had a commitment to it. Nevertheless, brethren, I've written more boldly to you on some points as reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's what it was all about for Paul. And I would encourage you, if that's not what it's about with you, it needs to be. If that's not what it's about with me, it needs to be. I could sit up here this whole morning, everything we talk about and talk to myself. And people would probably bean me with acorns when I left because they'd think I was a lunatic. I need this stuff. This is not a joke. But I say, if I say you, it's we. If I say we, it's we. If I say me, it's we. Uh, we all need this. And I, I would encourage you to be honest enough with yourself to acknowledge that in and of yourself, that we need this encourage, we we need to to speak with confidence, we need to do it, uh, have confidence regarding other people, in the faith, and then speak with boldness and minister the gospel, and have an absolute commitment to that, so that in the long run, even that is glorifying God. Okay, now. How do we get into this? Paul glorified God. I'm going to do this semi in an outline type format this morning. Romans 17, 15, 17 to 19 says this. Therefore I have reason to glory in, in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in the world, in, in word and in deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders and by the power of the Spirit of God so that from Jerusalem and uh, round about to Illyricum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. There's a lot in that. There's a whole lot in that. And here's the problem. We read over something like that and we think, boy, that's good for Paul. What was the focus of these 17, 18, 19? Yeah, three verses that I just read. <coughs> Looks like two on my screen, but it's three. <laughs> uh, so I had to count them. But what is the focus of it? Christ and Christ alone. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus. That is powerful. He doesn't say, I have reason to glory in how great of a teacher I am. Or how good of a speaker I am. Or how right I am with God. Or I, 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 anything. It is all. I have reason to glory in Christ. And that's it. Even though the reason why 
is things that he did. He preached the gospel wherever he went, and he didn't sway from that gospel. It was a gospel that remained true and still remains true today, and that's that if Christ, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again, just like Scripture said it was going to happen. And then he was seen by a bunch of people after he rose from the dead and then went back to heaven to intercede for us forever. <laughs> and if you don't think that's important today, talk to the Seventh-day Adventists. I, I'm using them as an example of this. Because uh, Ellen G. White specifically said that there would come a time when Christ's work on the cross wouldn't be sufficient and that he know he will stop um, interceding for us and that's not what the Bible says that is not what the Bible says that we have to stand before almighty God all by ourselves if that's the case then the gospel is futile the gospel is futile. Seventh-day Adventist theology states this, that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. That is the gospel. And what they mean by that, by their own words, and I've, I've conversed with many of them to this regard and know it to be an absolute teaching of Seventh-day Adventism is that uh, the power of God unto salvation is their gospel. But that power of God is my doing things and not sinning. That's their gospel. Is it important today? You bet. We, we have them in our community and they're believing these lies from Satan believing a false gospel and it's going to cost them one day forever if we don't tell them okay so we need to be able to speak boldly honestly truthfully and know the gospel and preach the gospel everywhere we go everywhere we go the gospel is to be the center focus of all of it. And then God gets the glory. If it's something I do, then why not me take the glory? But if it's something that Christ does, he gets the glory. What did Christ do? Died for me. He paid the ultimate price for my sin. Because I'm a sinner, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And while I was still a sinner, because of the great love of God and a grace which flows heartily from that love and the mercy that only God could show, while I was still a sinner, he died for me. And in that, I have hope. In that, anyone can have hope. It's not what we do. The gospel is very clear. Now, he didn't glory in himself, but in things that pertained to God. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the things which pertain to God. God works through his people and therefore is glorified. For I will not dare speak of any of the things which Christ has not accomplished. How? Through me. They're irrelevant. I can do all sorts of different tasks and they mean nothing in the scope of eternity. Nothing. But when Christ works through me, then who gets the glory? Christ himself. 
Those are the things I need to be concerned with. Those are the things you need to be concerned with. We all do. Paul fully preached the gospel. He says there in verse 19, uh, so that, uh, see, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that the Holy, uh, so that from Jerusalem and around about to Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Didn't leave it out. Told everybody he could possibly tell. Not what he had done. When you look at the things that Paul writes ever about he himself and what he's done, what kind of things does he bring up? I was heartily encouraging the murder of Christians. <laughs> I did this wrong, I did that wrong. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. You know, who can save me from this? You know, the, all the way, any of his writings, you won't find him saying, I did this and it was really neat. Never. You might be thinking of in First Corinthians where he talks about his apostleship, and that's a there, there was a purpose for that. It wasn't so that he would be glorified. It was so that they would listen to what God was saying through him. <laughs> it wasn't to build himself up. That's don't even go that direction because you won't convince me that it was for his own glory. It just isn't that way. It was all about fully preaching the gospel. I thought a bit about what that actually means. What does it mean to fully preach the gospel? What does it mean to fully do anything? To do all of it? It's, it's that simple. He didn't just preach that all are sinners. He didn't even just preach that Christ died for that sin. But he included with that that he rose again and lives forever. That's preaching the gospel. Paul's aim, and we're going to try to keep moving in, in chapter 15, verse 20. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. His aim specifically was to preach the gospel and then to people who hadn't heard. Hadn't heard what? Of God? No. Who never went to church of any sort? No. Who was his biggest concern? Judaizers, religious people. But God called him to pagans who worshipped gods of countless number, Pertnir. Do an internet search sometime for Roman gods and see how many there are. There's a lot. I can't remember the, the number of uh, what I have looked up. But it was a lot. Thousands. These were the people that Paul was going to. Corinth. Did they have false gods that they worshipped? Yes. Uh, I mean, we could go down through the whole list of all of the places that Paul went. And it was all to people with false gods. So it was people who were religious. So verse 20 is not talking about not talking to anybody who has never heard anything about God. What was the, the focus of it? 
that one little word, the gospel. They hadn't heard the gospel, and so what did he tell them? The gospel. And this went on and on and on and on and on and on. Romans 15, 21 gives us the reason for it. As it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see. And to those who have not heard, shall understand. That was the reason why he did it. The ones that hadn't seen it, needed to see it, some would believe. To those who didn't understand it, an explanation was in order, and some would believe. I, I would hope that we would take it just as seriously in our day today. I don't think that the Holy Spirit has a different plan for today than he did back then. I mean, living in the same type of conditions. False gods rampant. Uh, the one true God being eliminated from the whole scheme of things. And a government on the brink of doing everything, everything they can to destroy Christianity with promises made to that regard if certain of them get in. That was Paul's aim. That needs to be our aim. After looking at the book of Romans in its entirety, I don't know how you could walk away and say, God doesn't want me to tell others about Christ. I, I don't see it. The cost. This is where it gets tough. Romans 15, verses 22 through 24. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you, for I hope to see you on my journey and be helped, by, helped on my way there by you, if first I may enjoy your company for a while. What did it cost Paul? He was unable to see the ones that he loved. I've been hindered from coming to you. Did he complain about that? No. He kept it as a hope. But he couldn't see the ones that he loved. Who was it in this particular passage? The people in Rome that, it, that went to the place of gathering and was the church in Rome. And he wanted to see them, but couldn't. Why would he want to see them? Because most of them, or at least a good portion of them, he had led to Christ. And there was a bond there. And there were ones who had been taught by Paul and encouraged by Paul, and we'll see that next week. They were people who he had a desire to see, but couldn't do it. You know, Jesus said, if you aren't willing to give up family and not worry about that, you aren't worthy of the kingdom of God. I, I I don't got time to carry that on. I've got other thoughts, but un, unfulfilled desires was another cost. I desire to come see you, and I can't. 
One day I will. And I hope that it's all good. That when I see you, it's all just a, a reunion of joy. But right now, I just, I can't do it. Unfulfilled desires. Hopes and desires dashed, but remaining. What was the result? This is, this is to me, one of the fun, fun parts of this. It pleased them indeed. This verse 27. Now let's go 25. So I'm in context. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Acacia, Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are their debtors, for the Gentiles have been partakers in their spiritual things. Their duty also is also to minister to them in material things. What was the result of, of what Paul had done? The preaching of the gospel had got at least two separate places with such a, a outpouring of heart toward the people in Jerusalem that they actually gathered together what they could to send by way of Paul into Jerusalem to help the needy of the church there. And Paul's desire was to see him get it. <laughs> but the result was that they were actively fulfilling their ministry before God. What God had told them they needed to do, they were doing. This is people that Paul was witnessing to and sharing the gospel with and maintaining a life that, as best he could, exemplified what that would do. And people were coming to Christ, and that was the result of it. His ministry continued. Their ministry continued. He didn't give up because he wanted to be somewhere else, and it didn't work out for him. But he continued on. They continued on. Others joined Paul in ministering. And again, we're going to look at that next week. Some were right with him. Some supported him from a distance. And others grew in Christ. For these people of um, Macedonia and Achaia to send that money, the material needs that would help the poor of the church in Jerusalem, took them growing in Christ. It didn't just happen. They were growing in Christ. You know, it's something that I really see as Paul's big desire for any of the churches to whom he wrote. And if you don't believe it, look at the first of the any of the books that Paul wrote. And you'll see that his prayer for them is that they would grow in, in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. All of them. Now, he doesn't always word it exactly the same. But that is a consistent desire. And how are they going to do that? If we lead somebody to Christ, or if he had led somebody to Christ, and then just, okay, now you're saved, you're, you're another notch on the, on the good side of what I've done, and leave it with that, without any follow-up, any encouragement. Others were involved in Paul's ministry was another result. Other people got to be blessed because of it. I don't remember. It seemed like it was about three weeks ago we talked about the need for each other in our ministry. May have been a little longer than that. I don't remember. I'd have to go back and look to be sure. We need it. We desperately need it. I pastored a church that I was it. <laughs> I 
nearly impossible. I had a call from a pastor of my growing up years, and he offered, offered that was Lyle, and he offered to come and do some evangelism in our town. If only he and a couple of other people could have a place to stay. I had five kids at home. My house was full. <laughs> Wasn't that at all. But I brought it up to the church and they said that they were not going to put him up at all. So I asked if they would help, and I finally got a hold of him, and I had to tell him it's just not going to work out. There's no place. I mean, they said that we might be able to come up with a little bit of money to help him get a motel room in a town 17 and a half miles away. But no concern. So I asked them if they would help me go to the people of our community. And their exact reply was, it's not our job, it's yours. No help. I did. <laughs> I grabbed my Bible, and I grabbed what I needed, and I headed out from one door to the next. I couldn't get to every house. I didn't even know where they all were. I was in a position to have to do this, plus teaching Sunday school, preaching Sunday morning, doing Sunday nights alone. And they didn't want Sunday nights. They didn't even want Sunday school. But I told them, no, it's going to happen. <laughs> we're going to get into the Word of God as long as I'm your pastor here. We're going to get into the Word of God. But it all came back to, it's not my job, it's yours speaking to me. That was from including the head elder of our church, who, by the way, didn't even attend our church. He attended a Lutheran church across town. How he got to be the head elder, I don't know. I mean, this was a fiasco if I've ever seen one. Okay. Paul had other people involved in his ministry. I need other people involved in mine. You need other people involved in yours. We cannot do this alone. It is imperative that we work together or the gospel will not properly go out. The request, and this is something that I would cherish for myself. Romans 15.30 says this, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. He didn't just ask them to pray. He begged them to pray. And I would tell you right now, if you don't pray for me, please start if you don't pray for the pastor, please start. If you don't pray for your fellow believers who actually meet here together on Sundays and Wednesday nights, please start. And I'm not talking necessarily about, well, you know, this one's got this physical ailment or that one has that financial need or whatever but that we would be able to minister when the opportunity arises. Not if the opportunity arises, but when the opportunity arises. Paul's request was that they would pray to deliver from those who would do harm. We're going to see that coming up for proper service and that God would allow Paul to visit them and then there would be rejoicing refreshment. Those are in the last few verses of this. Verse 31, That I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe, 
and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God, and may be refreshed together with you. Okay. That says a lot right there. There's not a single, I have this health need. And I'm not discounting praying for those things. That's great. But when was the last time we prayed? I prayed, or you prayed, individually for somebody else's ministry rather than their physical, monetary, or financial, or whatever needs. That's what Paul was after right there. Conclusion to the matter is that what we do matters. How I live matters in your ministry. How you live matters in my ministry. How I live matters in my ministry. How you li ma live matters in your ministry. It's highly important. What we do matters. And then we need each other. I would trust as we have looked at the book of Romans and are wrapping it up that that has become apparent in every way because it's that important every bit of it we need each other we must let the Holy Spirit work through us how do we do that by letting the Holy Spirit work in us he'll never be able to work through us until he's worked in us the more he works in us the more we can let him work through us Go out and try evangelism without the Holy Spirit working through you. It'll be a flop. I'll guarantee it. I've tried it too many times in my life and I know it doesn't work. As we serve others, God is able to work through us. I want to read the last thing that he said by way of encouragement in chapter 15 and that's just a short verse that says now the God of peace be with you all amen that's how it wraps up right there that is the last thing that he really had to say to the people and then chapter 16 deals with those that helped him and those that he helped <laughs> and it's not to bring him glory it's to bring God glory always 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 acknowledge that we need one another I need you guys badly in my ministry oh that I would be the kind of person that you would need badly in yours it is the work of every believer every single believer to bring other people to a saving knowledge of Jesus whether they come or not is not up to us it is not our job to convict we looked at that as we went through this it is not our job to do anything in regards to salvation, but rather to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who need it. And that is the job of every believer. I, I've said this as we've gone through Romans in different places, but I want to say it again as we wrap this up. Keith Green, 
a musician that died, I believe, in 82. If not 82, it was 83, someplace in that general area. He said this. He said, this generation of believers is responsible for this generation of souls. You know what? We are. We really are. What are we doing about it? As you can see, there are a long list of names in the next chapter. Obviously, we're not going to go through every one of them and discuss them. But we're going to pick out next week some highlights, groups of people that helped Paul. Think about this for a second. If you were writing a letter to a fellow believer, how many people would be in the list of people that you helped or that helped you in the ministry? I think of some some that we all know. Can't imagine how long their list would be. But the reason why is because they've made the gospel top priority in their life. There's other people who probably wouldn't even be able to come up with a list of names of anybody who either they've helped or have helped them because there's no commitment to the gospel. Be committed to the gospel. I hope as I've gone through this book with you all that I haven't clouded anything And my heart's desire is that we would all grow to be the kind of people who rightfully carry the name Christian and do what God tells us to do. Take opportunities. It's not always going to be pleasant. It's horrible sometimes. Remember, Paul was persecuted for it a lot. Got thrown in prison for it a lot. <laughs> Had rocks thrown at him until he was pretty sure he was dead. Drug him from one town to another by way of boat in a bad time of the year and it sunk. For the gospel. And we sit back in our quaint little comfort zone and refuse to get out of it because I don't want to tell somebody about, about Jesus. I've thought a lot about this over the last, I'm going to say in particular probably four months, with the number of people who have left this earth that I personally know or I'm going to have to put it in the past that I knew. <laughs> How many of them are spending eternity in heaven? And how many are spending eternity in hell? And what did I do to make that difference? a sobering thought the conclusion to the book of Romans and the teaching of that book is that what we do matters we need each other we must let the Holy Spirit work through us as we serve others God is able to work through us that's what it's all about and I trust you'll walk away from this and
be willing at least to be the kind of person God wants you to be. We've got to close. We're out of time. Lord, thank you for being everything that we need for paying the price we couldn't pay for doing all that you did to make us right with you. Help us to be that kind of person that would love so much that we lay aside our own comfort for the sole purpose of seeing other people come to that same position with you. That's all you ask of us. And as Paul said, the suffering of this present age is not worthy of the glory that's going to be ahead in Christ. So thank you that you're able to work in and through us. Lord, I commit each one of us, myself included, very heavily in that, to this daunting task of bringing people to a saving knowledge of you. And we thank you for what you're going to do in each of us. In your name, amen. <laughs>